Well, myself, I'm, I'm, I'm the, uh, the ambassador of Mexico to the European Union, and I'm uh, uh, invited to to to, to co-chair this uh, panel because Mexico is the co-chair of the Forum on Science and Technology and Innovation for Sustainable Development Goals at the United Nations. And the part of the, the, the importance of this panel beyond our conversation today is that it's going to feed into the works of this forum, into the works of what we are doing at the United Nations, and also is going to feed into the thinking of the European Commission, and of course, the report is going to be circulated among uh, all the participants. Uh, so uh, we hope that this is a, a basis for a, a, a further thinking and of course to shape the, the international debate and actions on how to make sure that technology supports development. Now, uh, the, the first speaker today is um, Dr. Philin uh, Wonk. I don't know if I'm pronounced Wonk. Wonk is the uh, Philin is the first name. Um, she coordinates the research team Future Thinking and Dialogues at the Competence Center Foresight of the Fraunhofer Institute for Systems and Innovation Research. Uh, her background is in mechanical engineering and science and technology studies. And she will give us an overview of the landscape on uh, technological change and its implications. So the, uh, I will ask each of the speakers to present what they are going to say really and to go into the substance and we'll go one by one immediately. So thank you again and please fill in, let's start. Oh, no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your kind introduction and uh, yeah, thank you coming for coming here for our session. Uh, actually, as was mentioned, I'm from a foresight background and when I, Carlos asked me to give an overview on uh, the whole landscape of technical change, I couldn't help to start with a brief introduction on our understanding of foresight because I think this is important to also qualify the kind of uh, things we can even say about the future of rapid technological change. So I hope I'm gonna, going to be very brief on this, but I will say a few words about foresight as such. So how do we come to these findings? And then I will present selected findings from two recent foresight projects we have done on, uh, we call this kind of project horizon scanning project that look at what's happening at the landscape. And of course, it's very difficult to give an overview on all these emerging technologies, but I will pick a few areas that I think are interesting in, in this context here. And finally, I will make a few conclusions on what all this may mean for uh, how we can harness this kind of change for the SDGs. So, our understanding of foresight, uh, it's... Uh, well, this is something we developed in our group and it sounds very short and uh, brief, but actually there's a lot behind structured engagement with complex futures. And engagement in this sentence is very important because the future, we cannot predict the future. This is very important to keep in mind. But the, the, a thing, what we can do is to think about the future with people, together with people from different perspectives creating collective intelligence. And this is why foresight for us, it's always a dialogue, a dialogue of people with diverse perspectives. As you mentioned, my group is called uh, Futures Dialogue. And so it's not about forecasting or prediction or trend extrapolation, it's really about dialogues. Uh, yeah. And of course, analysis of trends and stuff is also important, but it's always only an input into the debate. And this is also why we thought this is going to be a dialogue making sense of these, all these developments. This is the only thing we can do about the future. The second is complex. I said in the previous session, I think uh, Shara also talked a lot about complexity and recognizing complexity, uh, it's talked about a lot uh, nowadays. Everything is complex and people more or less think it's the same as complicated, but complexity actually means that it's inherently uncertain. We cannot know how these things develop. We cannot know how rapid technical change will actually develop and how it will combine with societal change. 
And taking this seriously is really an important aspect in foresight. And this is also why we talk about futures and not the future, because we always try to systematically think about different futures. So, and the last word is the structure, because um, more or less all the time in all our meetings, we are discussing future, futures even. But uh, what is important in foresight to do it in a structured way to push us a bit beyond the usual, because what we tend to do is to extrapolate to date. Maybe we think everything will be a bit faster, a bit better, a bit worse, a bit uh, uh, different, but we cannot really think about uh, paradigmatic changes. It's very difficult for us, for the human nature. Also, um, well, all the research we have on cognitive biases and be the behavioral research we have, we ne really need to do something to actively challenge this bias. Otherwise, we only reproduce the prejudices we have into the future. And also, it's important to mobilize implicit knowledge because we all we know the things we are we know explicitly, but we also have some implicit knowledge and to generate collective intelligence because it's not that if you have people with diverse backgrounds in the room, automatically you get something out of it. Sometimes it's just everybody telling their perspective and uh, not really something new uh, getting um, emerging. These things are not integrated and this is um, important about the foresight message that we try to generate this collective intelligence. And then, of course, that we always introduce a system perspective. It was also talked about a lot in the previous session, this uh, systemic perspective on things, on the transition community. But this is also something that doesn't come natural to us. You really have to push people when they talk about technology also to think about uh, society. And on the other hand, if they talk about societal things, to also think about technology. So this is why we structure these dialogues. So this is, ah, oh, okay, <laughs> five minutes. So, and of course, if you have, uh, there are many different ways of thinking about different futures, and this is why there are different methods for structuring the dialogue. And for example, if you think about uh, what, um, where do we want to go? This is also a value-based discussion. This is when we do visioning or when you think about what different possibilities are there, then you would do scenario building. And the thing we are talking today is horizon scanning, which means looking at all the different things that may be up on the horizon. And actually, it's really one of the most challenging things in foresight to do. So um, when we do horizon scanning, um, it's important to take into account uh, insights from yeah, it's a, you cannot see the presentation, huh? Mm, well, you, you, yeah, maybe you, yeah, you can just. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm saying, you want to see things longer, you can see. I, I'm watching it from by the middle now. Oh, yeah. yeah. ah, okay. <laughs> I'm not worried. Okay, it's important to take into account re uh, re uh, really cutting edge insights from innovation studies that show that uh, new things uh, often emerge out of the interplay of different uh, domains. So even if we are requested, which we are often are at the Fraunhofer Institute, it comes somewhat naturally to, uh, to look for technological changes. We always try to convince our clients to also look at societal changes because really the novelty comes from the interplay. It's never only the technology. It's always the interplay of society and technology. So uh, we always try to do screening beyond the mere technology screening. And uh, another thing is that um, innovation, new things emerge from the fringes. So we are looking at certain things. So now, for example, it's artificial intelligence and digital things where we have seen previous changes, but often this the changes come from areas uh, where we are not looking at. So we are really trying to systematically push people to look at the fringes of the systems. And finally, and I think I made this point already, there's no way of detecting signals from the future, but it's really all, always only about uh, having multi-actor dialogues on different possible future developments and using imagination to thinking about paradigmatic change. There is this, I, I suppose many of you are familiar with the Three Horizon framework. 
and uh, which talks about different horizons of change. But the, the thing I find really important about this is that the third horizon, it can only be explored by imagination. It's nothing that we can extrapolate. We can say this will go on and everything will change. That's what we tend to do, but we really have to make an effort to imagine paradigmatic change. So, uh, the recent projects I'm going to uh, present some results from, and it's really a challenge to, to talk about the whole landscape, is the Observe and the RIPRI, and you are welcome. And the Observe is well documented on our website. It was done for the European Commission's Future Emerging Technologies Units, and the RIPRI is for, uh, we have done for the European Commission's Foresight Unit, but it's not yet published. And it's going to be published in a few months, I hope so at least. We are now finalizing the report. But I extracted some, some results. And both of them, they focused on technological change, but as I said before, we pushed them to think also about changes in social practices. It's a minor part, but it's also present. Oh. Oops. Oh, it's not so very well visible. Well, in Observe, we have developed, uh, we have identified um, around 170 so-called seeds of change in different are areas, mainly science and technology, but also social practices. And then we have clustered these seeds of change into so-called hotspots of change. So how, how could this all come together and combine to create uh, dynamic, maybe even paradigmatic change. So we have 34 hotspots of change. And uh, in RIPRI, we have 100 emerging radical innovation breakthroughs. So it's not yet published, as I said. And these are the groups uh, which are pretty much, they are not, not such strict groups because I think this is also a feature of current technologies that you can no longer put them in boxes. They are, they are all overlapping, so this shouldn't be taken too seriously. But uh, it, we did a semantic analysis actually to group them into, um, uh, to group technologies with similar, in a similar area together. So it's artificial intelligence, the human machine interaction, uh, actually, we selected these 100 technologies from thousands of candidates that came up in our uh, screening. So it's already an interesting result to see what are the groups that came up. So the, by far the largest group is in the area of artificial intelligence and robotics. And I think this is something other speakers will pick up on. Human-machine interaction, very important aspect of Industry 4.0. Electronics and computing. Biohybrids, and this is interesting again that these things are combining with changes in biotechnology and life science. Biomedicine, all these things on gene editing and stuff. Uh, printing and materials, so there's a lot of innovation coming up in the material area and uh, 3D printing, different types. Uh, breaking resource boundaries, um, several of the Innovation breakthroughs are in the area of, of uh, resilience and new material solutions, circular economy solutions. Energy, of course, and there one of the most dynamic groups is in batteries, battery technology and storage. Interestingly, this is really very fast. New things are coming up, partly uh, driven by the changes in materials also, by the new materials. And so finally, the group on social practices. We have also 23 global value networks, but I won't go into this because it's too far. So now on the observe hotspots, the, don't be afraid. I will do not go through all the 35. I just, uh, you can look it up if you are interested. It's all in the reports. I just want to make the point that, uh, of course, you have several that are directly related to eco innovation. For example, zero waste technologies. This was a clear hotspot of change similar to reprise the result. Uh, uh, air, uh, clean air research, um, food supply systems, the sustainable food supply systems, low footprint chemical processes. These are eco clearly eco innovations. Here some are some more energy storage came up there also like in Ripri. 
solar, solar technology, uh, new energy solutions, and water challenge. So th um, this is, what's it? Yeah, so several are directly related to eco-innovation, and we have nine that are explicitly IT related, and I understood that you are going to focus here on IT, so have selected few of them. Don't, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to go into the details of the technologies, but high performance computing, it was really striking how much change is going on in the area of computing. So uh, it's really many, and the interesting thing is that changes in hardware and algorithm are combining. So more and more the, hard, the computing hardware is tailored to different algorithms. So it, that we can expect many changes, <laughs> maybe unexpected changes from this area. Now everybody talks about quantum computing, but there are really also other things going on in this area. So then uh, enabling infrastructures on new economic patterns. Here is maybe, here is a Bitcoin in the image, but this is a bit misleading maybe even, but all these digital platform technologies that enable new ways of creating value together, uh, distributed collaborative platforms. This came up both in Ripley and Observe as an important area of change. Uh, human machine symbiosis so different ways of human and machines collaborating and i think this is also at the very core of the uh, industry for zero and uh, internet of things and it's it's a good example of a combination really of social practice changes and technology changes because we have on the one hand um, of course, technology uh, industry for, z for zero and everything, but the way people relate to each other is also changing through these new technologies. Oh, oh. so then, oh, sorry. I don't know. Internet futures, so uh, there were a lot of indications that the internet is changing in a technological way. So, for example, many expect that the internet will be more fragmented and distributed. There will be different speeds and different uh, pockets in a way, but also um, the way people use the internet. For example, we see already um, uh, movements to take more offline time or movement against even in Silicon Valley. And that's the interesting thing. People start to discuss uh, the impact of too much, much internet use on their kids. So this kind of thing. So the way we use it, we shouldn't take it for granted that it will always go on and on and become more and more. So maybe I should skip a few in order not to with the time, we have mixed realities. Uh, so this is really going beyond virtual realities, but really mixed realities, we called it. We have privacy providing system. And this is really also more than just data protection, but it's really technological system that, that um, create um, secure and private spaces. And this is also an interplay between practices and technologies we have robotics, of course, uh, many changes here, um, especially in the way robots collaborate with each other and also humans and robots collaborate. But also collaboration, you, uh, uh, robots and plants and stuff like this. <laughs> this is somehow strange, sometimes it's too much. Multi-signal sensing system, also an important element of industry for zero. And here also one uh, interesting element is that uh, new practices, maybe you have all heard of citizen science things, so people can go around and be kind of sensors collecting data within their environment. And this, this is a, can become an important feature of future um, innovation patterns. <sighs> I don't know. And, but, so now we had some uh, downright echo innovations and some downright uh, IT related clusters, but the point I want to make here is that maybe the most interesting hotspots 
are the ones where um, these things come together, where, um, for example, eco innovations are changed or enabled by innovations in the IT sector or in the artificial intelligence. For example, the game change enabling materials, and this was something that was actually selected by the FED group uh, from our results is uh, breakthrough innovations in the material area can be driven by these new learning algorithms, by the artificial intelligence, and there can be really unexpected combinations of materials through these new uh, IT technologies. The same future living spaces. So this is also a classical eco-innovation subject, the city of the future, cycling, the, the uh, mobility. But actually, how does this combine with digital spaces? How do uh, real sp sp physical and digital spaces combine? And this may uh, is, is it maybe not enough, enough recognized in the classical eco innovation perspective that these two things have to be brought together. So conclusions: uh, first of all, in both projects and especially in Ripri we see that the expected impact of artificial intelligence is uh, really standing out from the other technologies. And we have to think carefully whether this is a prejudice because we also asked experts and we had a survey and everybody thinks this, or whether this is really uh, uh, something behind it. Because the interesting thing is that even other technologies are as important and radical, like gene editing, but the artificial intelligence, it will influence all domains. Health, mobility, construction, energy, learning, social innovation, that showed in our results. So this is really different from other technology lines. Um, yeah, and uh, what we see also, in, especially in RIPI, that the use of data for public sector agendas that seems to be a key enabler. So that these data are now in silos. They are in, in with the companies that are running these platforms. But they have a huge power if they are somehow brought together and unlocked for these uh, for public agendas. But of course, on the other hand, we have privacy concerns and things. So finding solution here may really change a lot in this. Uh, then there are signs of an this we are discussing at the moment, we are writing the conclusions for RIPRI, and of course everybody is discussing what is the next wave of technologies. Everybody agrees that now is the ICT and with artificial intelligence, it has become accelerated, but what is the next wave? And some people argue that the clean technologies or the uh, res resilience related the green technologies are the next wave, and actually we see signs of this in the RIPRI result. We, will, we are discussing the conclusions now, so this is, would be something interesting to discuss. And one that could be called an undercurrent in all this is a resilience orientation. So um, really try a more localized and resilient solutions. This is also coming up st strongly. And uh, finally, what we can see in both projects really is the point I made in the beginning that transformative change is really expected, first of all, from the alignment of social and technological innovation. And if you think of past cases, this is really uh, things like uh, sharing economy, for example. This is the big changes this has introduced is not because of the internet or any especially fast uh, connections or something is because of the way people have used these things. And uh, the same with social media. I mean, it's not the internet, it's Facebook and stuff and the way people connect. It's the way kids use SMS. This changed the whole mobile phone scene. So in our analysis, it's always a society we underestimate and the radical change comes from the combination. And we, we talk about fast technical change, we should really keep this in mind, Soci the role of society. And the other thing is that it may come from unexpected combinations of the sectors. And I think we will hear examples in other presentations for this. And the last point is that several of these fast trajectories, they really have major ethical issues involved. So uh, ethical and legal it issues, things like gene editing, pace recognition, uh, very fast changes are there. 
drone technologies, brain machine interface, emotion recognition. So it's really important that we also strengthen our capacity for this kind of ethical discourse. I think that's what also here. So conclusions are specific attention to AI and data, take into account cross-sector interaction, focus on technology society interplay, strengthen capacity to go beyond the silos and ethical discourse, and finally, and I think especially for this international discussion we're having here, that it's, there's no one size fits all in all this. And observe, we made a special effort to give all the 170 seats of change, we printed them on cards, and all local actors have to do their own sense making and see what are their hotspots of change. Here I have an image how these people did this, for example. They created new ideas out of combination of different uh, changes and did system maps and stuff. It's all available, so you can, if you want to play around with a set of cards, you're <laughs> welcome. So we <coughs> Thank you, that was great. It's a very uh, rich presentation, very rich landscape that once you have present to us. Uh, and uh, I would like to go immediately to our next speaker. Uh, I will introduce uh, Rafael Carmona. He is uh, the co-founder of Green Momentum, a market intelligence and technological innovation company focused in clean tech industry in Latin America. He is also founder of Clean Tech Challenge Mexico, uh, which is the top green business accelerator program in Latin America. Um, immediate, please go, so we save time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, and I would like to thank the organizers of the event for, for the invitation to be here uh, to share our experiences. And yeah, I would like to just briefly uh, describe a little bit what we do. Um, we, we deal a lot with uh, early stage projects, uh, with uh, uh, startups um, through incubation and acceleration programs. And that has uh, allowed us to have a very good feeling of what's going on at the, group, at, at the grassroots level. I mean, uh, most of these uh, discussions are coming from the very top end of the political uh, point of view. Um, so I, I would like to focus on, on two very concrete examples that we believe are, uh, are gonna be critical into the the development of, of a sustainable uh, future in, in, in Mexico and obviously uh, around the world as well. So, um, okay, I think I need the clicker, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, well, first of all, um, I would like to say that I'm really, really excited to be living it in this time of, of human history. Um, we can see here uh, the energy sector context in Mexico. We have been through, you know, in the recent times, through uh, energy reform. Um, and this energy reform changed the way in which the electricity sector in Mexico is organized. For many, many years, we have uh, a government-owned, vertically integrated monopoly, which is now divided into uh, private sector and, and public as well. Um, however, one very interesting thing is that uh, during the long-term auctions for energy that we have seen out of this um, energy transition, the big winners have been wind and solar. So here we can see um, how this uh, exercise of, of the uh, energy reform in Mexico uh, opened the door for a lot of uh, new investment uh, from new, uh, different projects uh, around the country. And we can see that we're gonna have uh, additional seven gigawatts of clean energy in the next three years. Uh, and that represents a huge investment, around eight billion uh, US dollars. So uh, being a part of the clean tech industry and having this, this uh, environment, it's really, really appealing. So uh, what we saw before 
deals with uh, large scale uh, projects. Here I also want to focus on distributed generation, which is also huge in Mexico. We have uh, pretty much the same potential of uh, distributed generation that with utility scale solar photovoltaics in Mexico at this point. So we are, there are some estimations that by uh, 2024, we're gonna have about six gigawatts of distributed solar uh, energy installed in Mexico, uh, which is quite, quite interesting. Um, we're gonna have it on low income dwellings where we have, uh, uh, we need some government intervention in this case. It's not naturally driven by the government because we have heavily subsidized um, uh, tariffs for, for this segment of the market. So it doesn't make sense um, just for the end user to install photovoltaics. However, uh, for the government, it makes absolutely sense to make a shift between the, the subsidies that they, they are offering into the tariffs to invest that into solar um, systems and reduce the amount of energy that's supplied to, to these um, dwellings through the, um, through the grid. So um, that's one way in which we're gonna have distributed solar generation. Also we can, um, there's a very attractive market at, at this moment in Mexico for uh, mid and high income uh, households in, in Mexico where we have very high electric tariffs in terms of the level of consumption. So these tariffs are not subsidized. So nowadays we don't need any government intervention for, for these kind of applications. The market itself, it's making sense on how to, uh, on why to apply these, these technologies in, in this segment. And obviously for companies, and businesses, it also makes a lot of sense uh, to use the large amounts of solar energy that we have in Mexico. Um, so that's pretty much how we're gonna be envisioning the, the electricity, uh, the energy sector in Mexico. So we're gonna have uh, a, a broad uh, scope of technologies that are gonna be feeding in, in, in the, uh, the energy into the grid. So the system oper operator will have to um, have some uh, demand predictions, consumption predictions, uh, the generation uh, and, and demand uh, predictions, and define the prices of the electricity in, in this concern, in, in this, uh, let's say, open market uh, model that, that we're going to be seeing. So having said that, I would like to shift into mobility in, in Mexico. Um, this is Reforma Avenue. It's one of the main avenues in Mexico City. It's a lovely avenue. So whoever have been in Mexico City, I, I'm pretty sure you know this avenue. And sometimes you'll find it like this, pretty crowded. Uh, traffic can be just a nightmare. It's not always like that. Don't, don't be scared. You can go and you just move once in a while. But uh, if, if you're not lucky, you'll get this kind of traffic in, in Mexico City. So um, burning fuel in a very inefficient way, I mean, combustion, internal combustion engines, they have about 35, 40% efficiency. So all of these guys in their vehicles, uh, one guy per vehicle, uh, wasting gasoline in, in an absurd way, I think it's not a way to, to go. So we have air pollution, we have congestions, um, which are uh, a nightmare. I, I, I've been riding my bike for the last six years to work because it's just uh, unbearable for me to, to be in this kind of, of conditions in your car. Um, anyway, uh, I, I believe mobility, a, it's a great opportunity in terms of, of emissions, for example. 37% uh, of the greenhouse gases emissions um, are gonna be produced by cars, buses, um, and, and, and trucks in, in Mexico. So uh, there's a big area of opportunity to mitigate emissions if we tackle the, the uh, transportation industry in, in Mexico. So in terms of technology change, how fast this can work, uh, I like to talk about this. Maybe you have seen this, this example sometime before, but this is a picture of New York. 1900, 
Um, so if you can notice in the red spot, there's a little car. The rest of them are cars pulled by, by, by uh, horses. And just 13 years later, the scenery changed dramatically. If you can find the, the horse, it's somewhere in there, I'll help you. There's the horse. The rest of those vehicles are automobiles with combustion internal engines. So uh, we can see that in, in a very short period of time, there was a dramatic change in, in the usage of mobility in, in, in New York. So going back in time, I would like to show you this, this little guy. Uh, in 1995, a couple of friends and I uh, from uni, we built this solar car. We thought that was kind of a, a really interesting approach for uh, solving mobility problems. Uh, I mean, not using this car for going to work, but it was kind of a, a integration of technology to uh, implement it in electric vehicles. So at that time, it's almost 25 years ago since, since we built this car, uh, that was pretty much the, the image of the future that, that we envisioned at that time. Um, so, what I, I would like to say about this is that at that time, uh, there was only one major vehicle manufacturer dealing with electric cars. That was General Motors at that time. Um, I don't know if you know the, the story about the EV1, which was the prototype that General Motors produced at, at that time. Um, if you haven't heard it, uh, I recommend you a, a, a video that's in YouTube that it's called Who Killed the Electric Car? Have a look at that uh, story about what happened to, the, to this vehicle and, uh, and you will get shocked. Well, uh, I'm sure that the General Motors uh, CEOs are now uh, banging their heads out on the wall for taking the decision that they took at that time um, about killing that project. Uh, however, um, yeah, uh, as I mentioned before, these are very exciting, exciting times. This is a prototype of a solar car that is going to be released in 2019. This is a spin-off from the uh, TU Eindhoven, the Technology University of Eindhoven. It's called uh, Lightyear One, and, it, and it's a family car fueled by the sun. So you have uh, solar panels all around the body, and you will be able to generate enough energy to move around the city with this kind of, of vehicles without using any kind of uh, external energy. So that's a big challenge, and they are convinced that by 2019 they are going to deliver this, this vehicle. Further on, in 2016, there was a solar plane, the solar impulse. This plane was iconic. This project was really, really amazing. They handled to, trip, to make a trip around the world without using a single drop of fuel. Um, so this project uh, was uh, created by this, this guy in the cockpit, Bertrand Picard, which comes from a dynasty of, of adventurers and uh, explorers. Uh, so he was not uh, staying behind, he, he made this amazing uh, project. And, and this picture, I, I want to show you to you because have a closer look to the logos on the plane and who was sponsoring that. I don't see Airbus, I don't see Boeing. Uh, they were absolutely afraid of supporting this project. They were absolutely sure that this guy was going to crash in the middle of the Atlantic together with their names in the cockpit. So uh, they decided not to sponsor this guy. And the, the plane was built actually by a ship manufacturer. Um, the America's Cup, this, this big event for, for uh, sailing boats, um, uh, these guys uh, thought that it was very similar, the structure of, of a boat uh, and of a, of a plane. I don't know how they got to, the, to that point, but uh, definitely 
they managed to build a plane, a very light plane, a very large plane, and they handled trip, uh, make a trip around the world. And going back down to earth, e-mobility nowadays, all these brands offer electric solutions. It was not in my wildest dreams when I was building a solar car back in the 90s. I was envisioning this kind of, uh, of, of a scenario. You know? uh, one of the biggest company, General Motors, was backing up from going into the electric market. And now we see that everybody is in play. This is impressive, isn't it? Well, have a look at this. <laughs> 176 manufacturers of cars in China, and all of them have at least one electric vehicle option, okay? So this is something that you say, what the heck? I mean, we're, we're living exciting times, you know? So uh, you were mentioning that you don't have a lot of options of electric vehicles in, in Chile. So, uh, Maybe you can give a call to one of these guys and, and, and have a, a representation down in Chile, okay? Uh, and, and just to mention, for example, B BYD, that stands for Build Your Dreams, it's a fully electric vehicle company who's uh, producing from forklifts up to electric trains going through all kinds of, uh, of cars, buses, trucks, coaches. Um, batteries, electronic systems, also they have the full scope of electric transportation. So this is really, really uh, uh, a thing that I wanted to show to, to prove that the technology is there, it's ready. One of the key issues is to have the, uh, the infrastructure ready in the cities to, to have this uh, running in, in, in our places. Um, so, that's one of the key issues where, where I believe that uh, these technologies, uh, we, we, we're talking about uh, Internet of Things, we're talking about uh, blockchain uh, uh, systems to, to create these uh, markets between peer-to-peer -peer, uh, decentralized uh, energy uh, transactions uh, to maybe if I have a car, um, in, uh, I mean, a solar panel in my house, I can sell the energy to my neighbor who has an electric vehicle, and, and, and through a very simple app, I can sell uh, the, the, um, the energy to, to this person. You know? So this is pretty much uh, how, how the future is envisioned for, for cities, where most of the people is gonna be living in the, in the following years. Uh, where we have a, a whole bunch of different applications and solutions ranging from, from water, from energy, mobility, um, security, and all these uh, requirements that uh, need to be in place for, for uh, um, achieving these uh, sustainable uh, development goals uh, that are really uh, going to um, make a better world for, for everyone. So uh, that's uh, a little bit of, of the things I wanted to show and, and, and share with you. I think that my time is, is over and thank you very much. For thank you, that was wonderful indeed. For me it's difficult to stop each of you because the presentations are fantastic. Uh, our next speaker is Gabriel Gurovich. He is a serial and cross-cutting entrepreneur. I'll let him speak. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be really, really fast, as I don't want to keep any time from the discussion later. Um, and I'm going to focus in two particular clusters of technologies that, in my opinion, will impact uh, sustainability in a very important way. So I just want to start with this one. Uh, and probably some of you already know this uh, uh, intro into big data. It's out of Dan Ariely. And he said, like, a couple of years ago that since no one really knows what big data is, it's like uh, teenage sex. Everybody talks about, nobody really knows how to do it. You think that the rest is doing it, so you say, oh yeah, I know exactly what big data is. So I'm gonna try to introduce you into big data in two slides. First of all, this is a really technical 
complexity. Uh, what we're trying to do with big data is gather as much data as possible in real time uh, from all over the places, combine it together, and be able, the machines, to think as humans and recognize patterns and uh, try to do sy synapses over the data and not modeling anymore. There's no enough computer power to model data when you are gathering all the data in the world in real time, right? So it's hard to do it technically, but it's used in a very simple way. So some examples about that is probably, you know, augmented reality, and our first uh, speaker talked about that. So what you see here is exactly what, um, for instance, uh, Microsoft is proposing, which is you will use these kinds of uh, hologram lenses, and we will add into your physical world a new layer of information. It's a one and zeros that are going to be combining with whatever you do in a way that's going to make it easier for you, for example, to visualize how this motorcycle is going to be Instead of looking on a render on a screen, you will be able to actually put the data on the, on the bike and kind of play around with it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or if you're looking on a, a footprints for a new house, eventually you will be able to walk around or use your own uh, uh, living room as a play playground for your kids to play whatever. When you're called to dinner, you just do like click and everything's out. Or eventually save some marriages as you can give super precise instructions to your wife and how to change something in the house or whatever, right? The next uh, generation is what we call mixed reality. You also mentioned it. And this is way more interesting. As you can see, take a look on the kids here in this uh, um, place. They don't have nothing on their eyes. And look what they can see. So eventually, if this kid gets back home and say to his parents, I know what exactly like a whale looks like because I saw one, then you can tell him you didn't. You just saw ones and zeros. Or you can actually start understanding that this new reality is going to be so mixed that it's going to be very hard to say that's actually atoms or it's just data, etc. cetera. Uh, so the experience on how you gather information and how you understand the world is going to be way more interesting. This is actually happening. This technology is out of a company in Florida, uh, US. And it's the same technology as you remember David Copperfield making disappearing the, the Liberty Statue, uh, only that it's in movement. It's not static, it's dynamic, but it's only about some lenses and lights. Uh, and to fake our video uh, processing capacity. Uh, of course, big data, in order to be massive, they still have this, what I call the four Vs, with the short V, uh, to be solved. One, it's volume. There's so much data that we don't know exactly how to handle it and where to handle it. Variety, for instance, if we're trying to see what's going to happen with the price of oil, you need to mix not only uh, formal data, such as what's the climate in the Middle East, uh, what's the last price of, what's the stocks of oil, but also the tweet from President Trump, for instance. How do you gather, gather that data and, and, and work with it? Velocity, as you probably heard these days uh, in, in Wall Street, uh, they have this technique called uh, high frequency trading. So the key issue is how close you are from Wall Street as the data goes back and forth in your uh, cable, even if it's, uh, ¿cómo se llama? Uh, fiber, fiber optics, everybody, anyway, it takes some time. So if you're closer, you can win in that one. Uh, and finally, veracity, which is, of course, very hard to predict when the sensor is wrong or if you're being hacked and then machines taking decisions for you. So this is kind of the landscape today. And probably in the next couple of years, we will solve all these issues and we will see or we will sense big data pretty much in every area of our lives. Um, and behind it is what we call the artificial intelligence, because finally, as I said in the beginning, what we're trying to do is machines to think as humans. And probably you remember, like synapses is not more than a measurement of how many neurons you have and how interconnected they are, right? And that's your neural capacity, your brain capacity. It's the multiplication between neurons and axions. So let's see if this is in artificial intelligence and that's the core processor and you have 256 neurons connected by a 1024 actions, actually you have 
two gigas of synapses. It's a measurement. So the very first attempt to understand what's happening in the brain was Santiago Ramón y Cajal. He was a Spanish doctor who started to like actually look under the microscope what was inside our brains. And those uh, neurons connected there are actually the, the optical cortex. And this was more than 100 years ago. And then you see that our actual approximation to this is this one, which is an MRI slicing, putting on a movie, and of course taking away some neurons for you to see what's going on, and it's exactly the same. Bottom line, it's been more than 100 years, and our understanding on the brain, it's pretty much the same. Uh, uh, in 1947, two guys took Ramon y Cajal uh, diagrams and said, if we can do this under circuitry, it will look like this, and eventually we can create a machine that's able to recognize what it's looking at. Uh, so that's perception, actually. Let's say I'm facing this computer or this neural network with a picture of a bird, and I ask him, what do you see? Well, actually what happens is that all those pixels uh, started to go through the different uh, layers of this neural network, and after comparing and understanding what he's seeing, eventually he's going to get to the word bird. So mathematically speaking, you have X amount of pixels, you have something that you don't know exactly how it works, and you get to a solution, which is the word bird, hopefully it's only four letters long, right? Uh, saying that, this is exactly the same way as a kid learn. You show him several pictures, and you ask what do you see here, and he will say a monkey, no, a giraffe, no, a bird, yes, and when you like actually realize that he's looking at a bird and he knows the concept, finally what he's done is synapses. Okay, so let's say this is x times w equal uh, y. The problem is that this operator is not a multiplication operator. We don't know it, right? So what we're trying to solve here is this. Uh, and since we don't know the operator, it's going to be hard to do any kind of mathematical trick. But this one is possible. If you remember basic mathematics from school, you can always tear everything aside and do 0 equals whatever, right? Now, computers are really good on this one because I can ask the computer to minimize the absolute error. I will show him several pictures up to the point that he's not making errors anymore. So this is exactly the learning process as a kid. I was trying this one with YOLO. YOLO is this uh, image recognition free open platform. And I was showing this one with my same phone, several birds, right? And after a while, of course, the computer can see, let's say, millions of pictures of birds under one minute. He was not only recognizing that those were birds, but also he knew which kind was. So again, the learning process is exactly the same as humans. The difference is that so fast speed that after a couple hours, this guy was so good learning what a, a, a bird was. And then Eventually, we can go to the other side. We have the concept, a bird, we have the machinery, we have the artificial brain, and we ask him, show me what do you understand for a bird? And we can do this, actually. And this is what I call creativity, artificial creativity. After saying, show me what a bird is, this artificial intelligence here, what is creating, is a sum of all the pictures he ever saw about birds, and finally he gets to something like this, which in my opinion looks very much artistic, yeah? <laughs> I can do the same asking about a friend of mine, actually we tried, and I said, tell me how John looks like. And after thinking about a little bit, he zoomed up every picture he saw about John uh, with face recognition on Facebook, the tagging pictures, and he offers this representation of John, which actually is a zoom of every angle, he saw pictures in all the colors, and it looks like very shamanic art, if you want, right? So if you, bother to think about, is this creativity or not? Eventually we can get in that discussion. I will say, it's artificial creativity. Then we did this experiment. Uh, when we were kids, we look at the clouds and try to imagine forms, right? This guy only knows how to recognize animals, so he will find only animals in the clouds, right? So after a while, if you can see, he started to realize that there's a lot of different animals and other structures that we train him to understand. Or faces. Who do you see on the clouds, right? And the guys started to see and see. And then we did the double clicking effect. I see one particular pixel and go inside and zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. And what you see here is kind of this Escher uh, 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 
paintings, right? A lot of animals there because he was trained for animals. But anyway, and you can zoom in forever and you will keep on seeing things that the actual machine is offering you as a perception. It's very incredible. And the second one I wanted to talk is the crowd. And probably when I mention the crowd, you're thinking about crowdsourcing, crowd lending, crowd whatever, right? And behind that, pro it's the technology that uh, allows all these models uh, such as Airbnb and Uber. But what is really behind that is something super simple. Probably all of you have answered several times recaptchas and captchas, right? Uh, if you and another 1999 people will say like, overlooks is the word there, what you are actually doing, it's uh, collaborating in this effort, global effort, to digitalize whatever the humanity had written before the computer's era. Or if you say that there is two, the number there is 250 and some other thousand people said that, probably that's the correct answer and you're putting the address to a particular house in a particular map. Um, today, it's uh, 280 million recaptures a day being sold. Let's say it takes you three seconds, and that's the man hours dedicated a day to this effort. And I would ask, is there any other institution, public sector, private sector, or a combination of them that have this manpower, these man hours a day to actually accomplish this mission? And probably not, only the crowd. So what is behind all these models of collaboration is what we call uh, crowd-powered. It's uh, if I ask you, let's, let's set up a beach, in some place and you're only allowed to bring one grain of sand, we need a lot of people. But the effort is, let's say, effortless. It's seamless to, any, to each of us. Um, two very nice books on the matter. I, there's not much literary yet, or at least I need, didn't find because it's a very new phenomenon, but those are very good. And crowdsourcing.org, probably the most compelling uh, place to find information about this, and you will see this is not only business, this is civil engagement, this is community building, this is like good for everything. Uh, and a final note on this one, what is collaboration and what is coordination? And probably this is very close to your picture, but what happened in San Francisco by the beginning of the last century was this. Um, really, everybody knew that this new transportation uh, was good enough for everyone. It was uh, based on electricity, n n not polluting, etc. But it was slow. There were, not, there were few uh, trolleys. So pretty much everybody collaborated for this to happen. And you can see cars, uh, horses, people, and no one actually got like uh, in an accident, right? But if you really want to do this sort of collaboration on a global scale, you cannot. And then you need something, as I call it, like the uh, co coordinator, right? So if you think about it, what is behind here for the coordination stage, it's super simple. It's two lights. When you are around the city, you don't think that you are collaborating with anyone, but you know in the red light you stop, in the green line you move, and probably this problem is solved on a big scale. And that's exactly what this technology behind the crowd is uh, allowing us to do in so many other places. So that's it. Thank you. Fantastic. Yes, yes, yes. Very good. Um, now uh, we go to the final presentation of this morning is uh, with Dr. Carlos Montalvo, who. Yes, one minute interruption. Do we have 20 minutes left? Do we yes. Have, uh, one slide? Yes. Uh, that sounds great. Uh, that it will be an opportunity to interact uh, and it's very much into the idea of dialogue that we, we want to, to encourage. So if everybody's in... Uh, or, or I can present quickly and have the discussion in the after lunch. As we can do this hybrid. If you want, uh, maybe open up a little bit, uh, have some questions. You can interact among each other. I think that has been very rich. The presentations have been very rich already. And we keep it, uh, your presentation as an attraction for the afternoon, mm -hmm. if, you, if you agree. So um, yes, indeed, the, I will open now for a quick exchange. If any of you wish to make a comment or, a, or, or pose a question, please do so. 
Uh, if, you, if you do so, please identify yourself, just to, to know you a little bit of who is asking the question. I already see uh, one person. Please go ahead. Uh, how we handle with the microphone? Maybe we can between this so. Thank you. Please. Thank you. So my name is Lucia Dal Negro, and I'm from Italy. Uh, thanks to all of you for the presentations. Really, really insightful and. Um, I'm very interested in the um, aspect of uh, fostering this type of uh, technological innovations and I'm thinking about the scenario of uh, boosting the engagement of the profit sector vis-a-vis uh, -vis the complexity of such scenarios that you have uh, depicted before. So. Um, one thing that is uh, that I wanted to ask you is how to um, uh, get more and more the profit sector, so firms, company, on board in this type of scenarios, considering the like uh, risk aversion of many companies in dealing with complex, you know, um, perspectives of which they have no real, um, no real understanding. So. I can uh, I can see the point when you have to deal with a tangible object that could be correlated with the uh, revenues, but what about social innovation when you have to reshape the fruition of social um, dynamics? So this was my question. Thank you. Great, thank you. I don't know if there is any other question at this moment. Uh, yes. Also, uh, we, we get two or three questions, and then we. Address them. Thank you. My name is Margaret Colley, and I'm with the United Nations University in Bonn. And my question is on big data. And um, it would be great to hear from uh, Philine from Fraunhofer Institute as well to see how are you managing uh, the big data within your institute and how what's the future in those terms. This is one of the questions that we are asking ourselves within the research that we do. How do we manage big data and you know, how can we use it, you know, to further our research work? Anything you can shed light on would be great. Thank you. Anyone else for the moment? A question, comment? No? Okay. So please, uh, we all can uh, address the question. Let's start with Philin. Thank you for this question, actually. I wanted to discuss this as well and I skipped it because of time because I think this is actually exactly one of the main issue when we want to do this imagination of complex changes because uh, this is also something we always tell to innovation policy which is often our main client of our, um, our work that we also need new instruments where these players come together and experiment and uh, for example, do foresight exercise, but also do concrete experiment with, which combine new technologies and new practices. I mean, this morning in the session, for example, the, uh, uh, Shah told about this, um, how they are trying to do, what was it, water use or something, where they do experiment in different streets and one city. So this kind of thing we really need uh, for this. Yeah. And we don't have the instruments yet. you were saying, the, I mean, everybody's saying, in foresight, I mean, if you refer especially to how we, uh, how we use big data in foresight, everybody talks about it and everybody is saying we should do this more, but actually nobody really knows. And ac actually the Ripri project was the first time we really tried it together with our Romanian partner Prospectivas, and they programmed a machine learning algorithm that is scanning all these science platforms. And it's, it's really learned exactly in the way you demonstrated to create, uh, to uh, recognize novelty, to recognize, so this is coming here for the first time. But this was after years and years of learning the machine with exactly the type of learning paradigm. But we are not exactly sure how it works out and how, what is sure is we have to combine it with human uh, insights. But it can be huge, um, um, support. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. I would like to address uh, Lucia's comment and um, 
What I see from the entrepreneurial side is that uh, probably uh, traditional companies, well-established companies, um, they will always have this kind of uh, reaction you mentioned on the cars as well, that uh, no, this is not going to happen, uh, our business model is quite good, this is going to last for the next 30 years, etc. And then they start feeling um, competition or uh, new ideas from, from, from startups, right? And, and since they don't really understand what's going on behind that as big data or in, uh, artificial intelligence, they are faced into, uh, let's say, a dichotomic opportunity. Or I acquire those guys to internalize that knowledge and eventually stop that development and keep on doing my business, or I simply start preparing myself to be out of business. Okay, so in a social scale, um, I will say every entrepreneur, particularly more millennials or people that were born in the internet era, they have this clear view and idea on how important it is to collaborate, how important it is to do sustainable development, and how important it is to actually share the knowledge all around. Um, getting back then some value, not only for them as a particular companies and profit, uh, uh, but also to improve the quality of life of everyone. Um, I'm very, very confident that uh, as soon as we allow new generations to make decisions, probably we're going to get into these sustainable goals and challenges way faster uh, and in a less pollutive way with, the, with our world, etc. Um, and that's exactly why I, uh, I'm trying to show that this is super simple and you are not in the need of understanding the last coding line of how actually we program artificial intelligence. You just need to know that this is like a small kid learning uh, at the speed of light without any bias, not cultural, not nothing, uh, and whatever you want him to understand I also believe that human uh, assistance or, or someone with a lot of experience on a, pro on a process, on a particular phenomena, uh, it's relevant for the machine to actually learn well. There's so many, plenty of examples on how we actually make machine to learn without any guidance and they do like stupid things, right? Um, so in my opinion, um, the ability for traditional companies, traditional organizations, and, and leaders and, and policy makers to understand that these technologies are here, they are not that complicated to understand in a high level, uh, it's kind of the key part in order to actually make everything more sustainable for now and then. Someone else want to chip in? Um, <laughs> Carlos? Yeah, it's just um, um, a quick comment on the question of how to use data and research activities. I mean, this is something that uh, I guess um, everybody is facing in the research community, uh, as we see that there is indeed uh, the notion that there is an, uh, an enormous amount of, of data available. Um, but the challenge there is that, uh, as was mentioned uh, by Gabriel, is that uh, the quality of data is not necessarily uh, what you need. Uh, to, to depurate also big data is, is an enormous work, uh, but is, it must be guided always by some kind of theoretical uh, understanding of the phenomenon that you are searching for. And um, what we see, uh, what we have seen in the past is that uh, the usage of, uh, let's say, simulation tool, uh, tools and mathematical modeling, uh, at least let's say, from the side of, of the, the, the hard sciences, is, is well accepted. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, you, you present a model and, and uh, people understand the formulation very often, and people accept with no further validation when you have data uh, th that is gathered for that purpose. When we work in social science, the, the data normally is, is more spurious. Uh, we have very few observations across time yeah, and it's difficult to validate, so that because we, we base our research on many, uh, let's say, definitions that normally are developed for a specific purpose. Uh, now, when we work, uh, when we intend to work with big data, and for example, in policy analysis and strategy, there is always the idea of the black box. You put the data in the model, 
and often you get the results you want. Yeah, uh, uh, they say you wanted to predict something, you, you reached the prediction that you wanted, and often we are asked, how did you get there? Well, I still, I'm not sure. Uh, if, you, if you have, a, let's say, a nonlinear model interacting with a person, let's say the, let's say the Lotka Volterra model that where you <coughs> see two species or two actors competing, and then you say, well, this actor actually was the winning one, or the, the policy that these people want to implement will, will, will be the, with, with the, the good one. It's okay, but in which steps did you get there? And the problem is the same when you use, as, let's say, a discrete size of, of data as when you use big data. The problem is, is how we program the steps of how the model will run, which when you use neural networks, is even more worse because the process of how the data was created is not, is not clear. But when you see the model, uh, you have to accept that, with, uh, make the simul that when you ask somebody and you think they give you a response just by inferencing, you think, oh, this person is very creative, and sometimes you just reach it, get, get the, the result and accept it because it's creative enough and have some kind of face value. And it's, it's really like looking at another mind and accepting it. That's true. But that's a, a huge step that we still have to accept. That's it. So there is an example, it's very funny. Um, the artificial intelligence wrote, uh, saw all the music ever wrote by uh, Bob Dylan. And after a while, he realized that he understood pretty much why he wrote about love, war, whatever. And he wrote like a poem. And Bob Dylan was faced with this new piece of art. And he said, oh, in which of my albums was this song? You see? So he actually was able to trick him. Um, and, and, and it's like you said, Carlos, uh, at a certain point we will need to accept that uh, it's not only humans that are able to create something, it's also artificial intelligence. And then eventually the question is more philosophical. What's the difference between us and a machine that it's programmed to learn and create new pieces of whatever work? I don't have an answer for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else? Perhaps just on your question, uh, a quick reflection on the logic of public goods, and the provision of public goods, probably uh, the, the public goods at the national, regional, and global level, but at the global level, clearly, clearly there is an under-provision of global public goods, and we need to find ways to make sure that they are provided through incentives to uh, the, the state and non-state actors uh, through uh, policies, uh, cooperative frameworks that we have to devise. Uh, it, uh, it cannot be just let to the market. Also, that we have to, uh, when there is some, some kind of complex mm -hmm. challenges that we are facing, all to, all to chip in uh, state actors or non-state actors when they only pursue their interests, they don't, uh, are, are not capable of, of providing the global glo public goods. They have to find platforms for cooperation and with a clear goal of what they are trying to achieve because it's exactly for the common good. So I think that that logic may be interesting for, for you to reflect as well. Anyway, now we have eight more minutes. I don't know if there is any other particular question at this time or comment or otherwise. Um, I don't think it's enough time for you to, no. to tell me. Uh, well, it, no, it's, it's, I, I think it's not enough time to, to present, but um, I just, I mean, the eight minutes, I think probably you want to, to eat something and I don't want to stop you mm -hmm. longer. I just want to try to hook you a little bit for you to come back. At, at, at 2 p.m. Uh, um, what we have seen now so far is, uh, let's say, the potentiality of the technologies to really have an impact <coughs> in different areas of life. Yeah? And, and this has to do with the, with the sustainable development goals that, that this reflection is about. Um, um, in the next presentation, what we will try to, to look at is that, uh, indeed, there are very positive developments 
yeah, that will contribute to uh, create this magical experience of, of the new technologies and the internet, including the, the, the new ways of being creative. Uh, but also there are other areas that are being challenged uh, related to job creation, to who, the, who takes the, say, the benefits uh, out of the, the new technological developments, uh, how competition is being, uh, new forms of competition are being created, and new ways of accumulation. And there are, as there are very fantastic things coming ahead, there, are, there is a dark side also to it. And uh, I want to explore with you this part that in the next uh, half an hour. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much. I think that was a, a good uh, tease, a good, uh, good introduction for the afternoon session. So we meet here at two. Mm -hmm. I really want to uh, thank the audience for having this first part with us and also the speakers. It really was fantastic. I wanted to listen more of the uh, initial of the presentations, a longer presentation. I was uh, totally um, sad to have to cut each of you in, in each moment. But again, thank you, and I hope that we get together in after a good launch. And the launch is also an opportunity for networking, also for interacting with the, the speakers among yourselves as well, because there is a, a very interested and a well-prepared audience for this uh, uh, seminar. So thanks again and good, after good lunch and good afternoon.